Welcome to Exploring Computing. Today's video is creating web pages, forms for inputs. So, so far we've been looking at how to present information on a web page, but websites do more than just allow the presentation of information. They actually allow interaction between a viewer and the website itself. And so in order to do this, we need to use forms. And so in this video, we're going to show you the basics on how to create forms. So here are a number of different forms here. Um, the top form is uh, Amazon uh, search. And then we have the New York Times searching for articles. Um, we have the Weather Channel looking up for weather. And then we have uh, Google Maps asking for food delivery. And this one's a little bit more complicated than the other ones because you can see we can uh, select some pull down menus here to limit our options by their cuisine or the hours they're open or some other options as well. Forms can get much more complicated. So uh, on the left, we have the advanced search form for books at the Stanford Library. And you can see we've got all sorts of things we can check. And then on the right, we have a uh, creation of a new account at HBO. So this is the sort of thing we're talking about. We're talking about how to allow the user to enter information on a web page and submit it to the web server. Now in this class, we're going to be focusing on how to actually create the web page in order to submit the information rather than how the server itself is going to uh, respond to that information. Uh, CS 106 E students, we are going to take a, a bit of a look at uh, exactly what happens to that information once it gets submitted to the server. Uh, CS 105 students, uh, I, as always, I'm going to go ahead and put those lectures up uh, at some point later this quarter after you guys have a little bit of programming experience under your belt if you want to take a look at those. Okay, so here's our sample form here. Um, we're allowing people to provide information on a trip that the ski club is going on. Um, and you can see there's all sorts of different elements that uh, allow the user to enter in information. And in HTML terminology, these are referred to as form elements. So this whole item that allows the user to submit information that is referred to as a form. And then the actual elements where the user enters in information, types in text, clicks on buttons, those are referred to as form elements. That's a HTML only term. In general, these sorts of uh, items are referred to in computer science as controls. Uh, you may also hear the term widgets. So an HTML form element is essentially a control uh, which is appearing on a web page. And so we're going to be putting all of our controls or our form elements inside of a, a form tag. Um, for now, uh, I'm just going to put an ID on this just so we can identify it. Uh, we can maybe do some styling information or, uh, you know, if we want to work with this somehow, I need a way of getting to this. And so I can go ahead and use the ID for it. ID is not actually necessary. There's a bunch of other attributes which may appear here. So, for example, if the user is going to enter an information into the form and submit it to the web server, the web server needs to know where the program responding to it will go. And so there's a variety of other attributes which would appear in the form, uh, depending on how you're planning to use it. For now, we're just going to concentrate on, uh, and there goes Maddie. For now, we're just going to concentrate on having uh, the form tag itself and uh, the elements that appear inside of it. We can talk about uh, the different attribute values that might appear in the form uh, at another point in time. Okay, so let's start off with uh, the elements up at the top. These are text fields, um, and these are going to be created by using the input tag. And we're going to see that the input tag is actually a multi-purpose tag, which creates a bunch of different elements that we're seeing on this web pages, as well as a bunch of other elements that aren't appearing on this form at all. And the way the input element works is we determine exactly what the input element is being used for by looking at its type. And so that in this case, the type equals text. And so that means that the form will allow the user to enter in text into a single line uh, text field. You'll notice that there's a closing slash here, and this indicates that there is a single tag instead of a pair with a start and end tag. And I want to go ahead and give it a name. Uh, I've got multiple text fields here. And when this information gets sent to the web server, the web server needs to know how to identify which pieces of information go with what. And so 
the name determines uh, how this is going to be identified by the server when the information is sent. In addition to the name, uh, when the user enters in information to the form and clicks on the submit button, uh, there's going to be a value, which is whatever the user has entered into the form. And what will happen is the server will receive the name and the value as a pair. So if I enter in the word none here, uh, what will get submitted to the server is that the credit field as determined by the name on that text field, the, the server will receive the information that the credit field has the value none. Now, so far, our text field has started out empty. Uh, you can start off the text field with a pre-existing value. So, you know, probably if there's a field for credit card, the correct answer is not none. And so we might want to start off with a value. So we could start off with the value one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Um, and so the user would be able to either submit it, the initial value, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, or they would be able to edit it. In addition, uh, there's another attribute value pair that you can put into the input tag called the placeholder. The placeholder gives a hint as to what's expected. So in this case, our hint is enter credit card number. You may be wondering what the difference between providing a value versus providing a placeholder is. And essentially, the value is what will be submitted to the web server if the user doesn't enter anything in the field. And if they do click on that field, the value will be the initial value that they can edit. In contrast, placeholder, you'll notice that it's got that light gray color. And if the user were to actually to click on the placeholder text, it would immediately disappear. It is not actual in an actual initial value. Uh, it's just sort of there as a hint. All right, uh, another thing that's important to note is that if I have the input tag here, uh, I give it a name. Remember, the name identifies, uh, when this gets submitted to the server, the name identifies uh, which particular text field is getting submitted. But there's no actual label that appears to the user. So if I want a label to appear here, so let's say I wanted to say credit card, that's in addition to the input tag. So you need to include the input tag and then whatever formatting you want to do and whatever labels you want, that is separate again from the, uh, the input element. The input element is just going to create that blank empty box. You may also run into the password input type. Um, and this looks and works very similar to the text type. Uh, the difference being that if somebody starts typing to a password, you will either get the circles or you will get asterisks or, or some other indicator that you have been typing into the password field, but you won't actually see the text. Now I should caution you, this password field is uh, less secure than you might think. It protects from somebody looking over your shoulder and watching what you're typing, but it does not actually protect the transmission of information as uh, the text gets sent through the internet. So if you really want to have your password protected, which of course you do, you need to use the HTTPS secure variant of the HTTP protocol. Don't just set the input type to the password and expect that, that that is sufficient. That is definitely not sufficient. Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, there's a bunch of different types of uh, input elements. And so our next type of input element is the checkbox. And our example from our Ski Club webpage is we're going to have a, a bunch of dinners that we're going to provide for people coming on the ski club trip. And people can indicate whether or not they want to uh, have that particular dinner with the ski club. So there's a bunch of check boxes and they can go ahead and click as many or as few of the meals uh, as they're planning to spend with the ski club. Now, again, as before, with the input of type equals text, there is no label provided. So uh, if you want you know, there's a name Friday dinner, but Friday dinner uh, in the input name equals Friday dinner. That's actually information sent to the server that is invisible to the user. If you actually want an actual label on the web page telling them what this little square that they're supposed to click off on is, you actually need to manually uh, label it. Okay, now if you want the checkbox to start off as checked, you can do this by adding the uh, attribute checked to the input tag. You may also see people starting off the value as either just putting that 
attribute checked there or putting an attribute value pair checked equals checked. What is going on there? Well, I mentioned a couple of times that I generally use a variant of HTML called XHTML, which has slightly stricter syntax rules. And so there's a bunch of different syntax rules. Uh, tags and attributes need to be in all lowercase. Uh, if you're using the standard rules, you can you know, have ch input with a capital I, um, you can have input with a capital I and a capital T. Uh, you can mix the case on the attribute names. Uh, you can get quite a mess and it will still be legal. Um, one of the rules in XHTML is that if you have an attribute, you must have a value. So uh, if we are following strict XHTML rules and you were to just say type equals checkbox, and then you would just say checked with the attribute name with no value, that would actually be illegal in XHTML. So uh, if we've got a, an attribute and we don't actually have a specific value we want to set it to, um, the convention is you set it to the name of the attribute. So thus you may see checked equals checked. In this case, I'm going to just uh, violate the uh, XHTML rules and just revert to standard HTML rules and just put the word check there. I think uh, students find that a little bit less confusing. Okay, so those are checkboxes. Uh, another type of element you'll run into quite frequently is something called a radio button. Here are the radio buttons that I have on this web page. Um, I allow people to determine whether they're planning to uh, drive up to the ski lodge on their own, if they want to take a bus with the rest of the ski team, or if they've got a lot of extra cash, if they want to fly up there. Um, and so the user needs to select one of these different options. And in addition, uh, they can determine whether they want their own room or they want a double room. Now, one thing that's important to note is the difference between a checkbox and a radio button. So on the left here, I've got my checkboxes, and on the right, I've got my radio buttons. And the difference here is I can check as many or as few of the checkboxes as I want, whereas the radio buttons, these are mutually exclusive choices. It does not make sense for me to say, yeah, I want to go on the ski trip, but I want both a single and a double room. You need to choose either one or the other. In contrast, as far as the meals go, you know, it would totally make sense for me to say I want Saturday's dinner and Sunday's dinner or, you know, I don't want any of the dinners or I want all of the dinners. And so these checkboxes are, are all independent of each other, whereas the radio buttons are mutually exclusive. And you do want to make sure that you use the correct type of element for the correct purpose. I definitely have seen a bunch of amateur web pages where somebody's like, hey, I think those round buttons look really cool, so let me go ahead and use those, even though this is not a mutually exclusive choice. And that actually is, one, it's confusing to users, but two, it also causes big problems because um, the radio buttons aren't designed to uncheck normally, so, so don't do that. Use the square checkboxes for choices where the user can choose as many or as few as they want, and then use the round radio buttons when you have a mutually exclusive set of choices. These are called radio buttons because uh, they're similar to the buttons on a car radio. So let's say I've got this car radio here and uh, station one is set to rock, station two is set to rap, and station three is set to country. And let's say I'm listening to some rap and I decide I don't like this song and I hit the country button. What should happen? Should I continue to listen to rap and listen to country simultaneously so they both play over the radio at the same time? No, that, that would be weird. Uh, what happens is by clicking one of the other buttons, uh, whether I click the rock button or the country button, that deselects the rap station and selects my new station. And so that's the way these radio buttons work. When you select one of the choices, whatever the previous choice is, is deselected automatically and you have a new choice. Now, another issue that comes up is that you may have multiple sets of mutual exclusive choices. So I've got the choice of travel arrangements and I have the choices of rooms. And so these are both different sets of choices. They're independent of each other. You know, I don't want the situation where the user says, oh, I'm going to, uh, I, I need to select two of these. So I'm going to choose bus and airplane and leave the room choices unchecked. That doesn't make sense. So somehow I need to tell the web browser that the nun, bus, and airplane are all associated with each other, and that single and double are associated with each other. And so I do this by using the name here. So if you look at the, up at the top, 
I've got the three input elements of type equals radio for the travel arrangements. And down at the bottom, I have the two choices for uh, the room. And notice that the three up on top all have name equals travel and the two down at the bottom say name equals room. And so that's actually how the uh, web browser is determining which of these I can choose simultaneously and which ones are mutually exclusive. You'll also note that I've got values on these. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, when we were talking about the text fields, what's gonna happen here is the user is gonna select a bunch of different options here, and then they're going to submit the information to the web server. And so the name, uh, which we were just talking about a minute ago, not only tells the web browser that, hey, these, these sets of radio buttons all work together as a set of mutually exclusive choices, that's also the name which gets sent to the web server telling it, hey, this is the particular choice that I'm sending to you. And then the value is the value that goes with that name. So in this case, um, with the current selections, what the web server would get is it would get the information that travel was set to air and that room was set to double. I should also mention, I think this was kind of an odd choice, but if you create the buttons as shown here, um, using what I've shown you so far, actually none of the buttons are going to start off checked. So, you know, I said it was mutually exclusive and it's certainly true that you can't choose single and double simultaneously, but it turns out you can choose none of the above. And the way we've got the web page set up right now, the initial value is none of them. Uh, and so most likely you want one of these to start off as checked. And so the way we're going to do that is we are going to use this attribute checked um, and this is the same one that we saw with the checkboxes. And so if you go ahead and create a radio button and you add in that extra attribute checked, then it will start off initially with that uh, darkened center indicating that that is the initial choice. I also want to point out that as with the checkboxes and as with the text field, there's no labels associated with these input elements. And so you know, I've got that room choices uh, and single $80 and double equals $40. That's extra. I had to add that in addition to the input element. You'll also notice I'm creating a line break there in order to put the room choices uh, on a different line than my two radio buttons there. Okay, another element that shows up on our web pages is what is generically referred to as buttons. Uh, this particular web page has two buttons. It's got a submit button and a reset button. And the submit button, when the user clicks on the submit button, all the information in the form is gathered together and all those names and values are sent to the web server. What happens when you click on the reset button is all the information the user has entered gets tossed out and everything gets returned to its initial value. So what that would mean is if you had a text field with an initial value uh, and the user had replaced that initial value, the initial value would be reset. If you had a checkbox or a radio button, which you had started off with as checked, um, and the user had changed those settings, it would have been returned to the initial value. So that's what reset does. You'll notice that I've got type equals submit and type equals reset here, but I've also got value equals submit, value equals reset. What's that? What's going on here? Well, it turns out that the web browser manufacturers don't really agree on what these buttons say, uh, and they could say lots of different things. And what the value is in the case of the submit or reset button is this is actually the text that appears on the button itself. And so you can see here uh, in Firefox and Edge, uh, the if, if I don't have a value on these, uh, instead of saying submit, it actually says submit query, whereas Chrome says submit, uh, and Safari iOS says submit. So, you know, if you want to make absolutely sure that the text on these buttons appears the way you want, go ahead and add in a value. In addition to having the submit and reset types, you can also create a generic button. This isn't going to make sense when working with a web server, but it turns out that sometimes you're working without a web server. Just 106 e students will talk about this in another lecture. If you're doing something called client-side processing, you can actually carry out some scripting in the web browser without sending the information to the web server. And you would do that by creating a button and uh, input type equals button. And then again, you would give it a value to say what, what should actually appear on the web page. So these all appear the same to the user. 
but they do have different purposes. Submit, submits the information in the form to the server, reset, resets the information, and the generic type equals button, that's gonna be used for client-side scripting. Okay, another element that is on our Ski Club webpage is a select. Um, and so I'm allowing the user to select if they want a rental package, they might want no rental package, they might want a ski package, they might want a snowboard package. You can tell how long it has been since I've skied because these prices are clearly way the heck off. This idea where I click on something and then the menu appears, this has a bunch of different names. You can hear this may be referred to as a drop down list or drop down menu or a pull down menu. But in HTML, it's this is just referred to as a select. And here's how I actually create it. So you can see that there's a select uh, tag, there's a start and an end tag, and then there's a bunch of different options. Uh, where the options are their own uh, individual elements. Uh, we want to go ahead and give the select a name because this information is getting submitted to a web server and we need to identify uh, what, what piece of information is being sent to the server. And then the values that will be sent to the server are actually the text that appears between the option start tag and the options end tag. And so here, um, what the server is going to receive is that the rental package is none, but this can cause some problems because this works fine for none. But if I switch to ski package 25, it turns out that that is actually going to get converted to this ski plus package plus parentheses percent 24, 25. What the heck is that? What's going on here is that we can't tr transmit a dollar sign normally uh, through the HTTP protocol, so it needs to get converted, and it turns out that percent %24 is the hexadecimal code, which corresponds to an ASCII dollar sign, so it gets converted. Since it's kind of a little bit messy to work with on the server, and so what we can do here is we can add values to each of the options. Uh, so now I've got value none, value ski, and value board, and what we get set is like rental package none, same as before, uh, but instead of plus package plus percent 24, 25, uh, what would actually get sent is just rental package ski because I set value equal to ski. So you can see that, that that would be a lot easier to deal with. Okay, now the way I've got it set up right now, the initial value that is appearing is going to be none because that's the first thing in my list of options. If you want to change that, you can. Uh, let's say I wanted the rental package to start off with a ski package. Uh, the way I'm going to do this is there's a selected attribute. And if I have an option and I add a selected attribute to it, that will be the initial uh, element displayed on the web page. You can also set a size on the select, and that will turn this from a pull down menu into something referred to as a list box. And so you can see here, I set the size to three and all three elements are appearing instead of having a single element appearing and the user having to click on that in order to see what their options are with a list box, which again, you create by setting a size. Um, if you set a size that is smaller than the number of options, you'll actually get a little scroll bar there and the user can scroll up and down to see the options. Uh, there's another attribute that I'm not gonna show you called multiple, which actually allows the user to select more than one item simultaneously. That needs to be done with the list box. I think it's kind of confusing because there's no strong agreement between the web browsers for how you actually select multiple items. Like we click on one item and then you want to select the second one. Do you, do you hold down the shift key? Do you hold down the control key? It's, it's really kind of a mess. I don't really recommend multiple, but you may run into that on web pages. Uh, so if you do see an interface where you do see multiple items and the user is allowed to click on more than one of them. That's a select tag with multiple. Okay, we're almost done with our elements here, uh, with our form elements here. Uh, here's one more. This is a text area. The difference between a text area and a text field is that the text area allows multiple lines of text, whereas the text field allows only a single line of text. The text area is a little bit odd in that it's got a start tag and it must have an end tag. If you were to just have the start tag and then try and end it with a closing slash, that would actually be an error. So that kind of raises the question like, what goes between the text area start tag and the text area end tag? And so the idea here is if you want to add 
text that will appear as the initial value, you're not going to use the value attribute value pair. I'm not quite sure why not, because that 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 would seem logical based on what we've already seen, but that actually turns out not to work and be illegal. Um, if you want to put some initial text into the text area, you actually have to put it between the text area start tag and the text area end tag. Also, uh, there's a variety of different ways to set the initial size of the text area. Um, I'm going to recommend that if you want to set an initial size to the text area that you do in cascading style sheets, there's also an HTML way of doing it um, using a bunch of attribute value pairs in the text area tag itself. All right, so that's it for the elements that we're going to go over. I do want to mention that there are a bunch of other elements that you could run into. So uh, you're seeing them being displayed here. There's a number uh, which displays a number and you can see there's up down arrows that you kind of sometimes refer to as a spinner, which you can increase and decrease the number with. Uh, there's a range uh, input type, which creates the slider. There's a date, there's a time. Uh, and there's a color, which if you click on it, opens up some sort of a color dialog, like the uh, color dialog I'm showing here at right. Okay, that's it for now. I'll talk to you all soon.